was invited to um, write a chapter on querying digital archaeology um, last year, and it's dreadfully, dreadfully overdue. And so to try to get through some of these issues, I decided to present on um, my uh, kind of flailing about uh, this subject so that I can helpfully get, elicit help from the audience to um, think through some of these concepts. There's a lot here, um, and so we're going to move pretty fast. Right. So, um, this is the gay caveman. You might remember him from um, 2011. Uh, my favorite one, I think, is, here we go, the silhouette. Um, and it's a kind of an unwitting homage to Tootsie, kind of against the, the, the flag, in, um, and has, if you, if you were just uh, unclear on any of this, obviously the two golden linked symbols for Mars would just hammer it home, you know, this is the gay caveman. So the way that the media decided to represent all these things was very interesting, very odd, and um, showed a particular silence in our visual representations of the past. It showed that we had, um, as archaeologists, not produced any kind of visual vocabulary for the media to use in this sort of thing, and so they produced it themselves. Uh, with a kind of a, a variety of results there. Um, and so this find was completely uh, attacked by various blogs, uh, Rosemary Joyce, John Hawks, and Christine Kilgrove all thoroughly refuted the article and the respective blogs. They even happily gained enough media attention to uh, have a corrective article that was published. And so um, it's easy to write, write off these descriptions of uh, gayness in the past as attempts to receive internet hits or likes, but we just don't produ provide any alternatives, um, even as we claim that digital technologies make visualization more accessible. So this paper is, in a way, trying to address these silences or blank spots in, the, in queer visual representation of past peoples. And it's very, very difficult, um, as I will explain later. But it's so important as we start finding these individuals in the past through bioarchaeological bio techniques, through ancient DNA, we can get at some aspects of individuality that we weren't just a we weren't able to really in the past. All right. So um, we will gallop through the following topics as fast as we possibly can. Um, I wanted to situate this critique within the feminist critiques of archaeological visualizations. Uh, I want to see how digital archaeology is perpetuating stereotypes, how can we address these silences, and how can we, this is, this is the real key here, destabilize heteronormative representation in archaeology, and what are the potentials in that? Um, and so this, we are at Southampton, and so we all must worship at the altar of Steph Moser. Um, who provided this fantastic um, corpus of works that really, um, all the way from this very early paper, 1993, all the way to today, has been publishing over and over about archaeological representations and visualization. Um, she, let's see here, um, she writes about hominid reconstructions, and um, she shows how representations of the past reflect archaeological practice. Um, this early survey found that males hunted, made art and tools, buried the dead, performed rituals, forged for plant resources, and comprised the central position in images while female figures that performed domestic roles were sitting or crouching, often in the shadows in the background, but kind of lurking back there. <laughs> and breastfeeding, obviously. I found that really interesting, is that that's what, how they, they indicated the, the female role in the past is always breastfeeding. Um, and then interestingly, at the, on the same, at the same time, 1993, on the other side of the pond, Diane Gifford-Gonzalez um, did a visual analysis um, that revealed that not one of 231 depictions of prehistoric males shows a man touching a child, a woman, or an older person of either sex. Um, no child is ever shown doing any useful work. She identifies strict gender segregation where women are idealized static mothers and anonymous drudges with no gender crossovers. Men are men, and women are women. And I mean, if you don't know, that's a fantastic title. You can hide, but you can't run. Um, and so she looks at this, this caveman diorama here, and we will see uh, another part of it is in the corner in just a minute. 
Um, and so there are several aspects of this research that I'm going to just have to bracket and kind of run through really fast. Um, there's also the attending representation of archaeologists as um, archaeology has been gendered male. That is changing more recently, um, but this is Alfred Kidder who said that there are two kinds of archaeologists, the hairy chested and the hairy chin. He doesn't have any hair on his chin, so I don't really want to speculate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it's once again an epistemic marker, hair with the, the um, adventurer, cowboy, hero, often seen as a talking head while women are kind of drudging in the background. Um, so this is the left side panel of this diorama. You get to see um, the men in here drawing um, cave paintings, telling stories, having a fabulous time. And then if you look left outside of a little portal, there are the women uh, always dredging with the hides and always making stuff in the background, having, you know, minding the kids while the dudes inside party. Um, but these feminist critiques of um, representations of the past were kind of, they are cor correctives. They're very well established. And, um, but in reviewing the impact of feminism in archaeology, Conkey notes that 80% of the literature that one might consider under the rubric of feminist archaeology is about finding women um, rather than complicating ideas about gender. So we're just going back and we're actually just trying to identify women um, and what their roles were in the past. And this is, um, so it, we're, we're trying to move beyond that. We're trying to complicate ideas about gender in the past, but there's no real good visual representation of this. Um, this um, is a work that is fairly famous in Canon of late Paleolithic hunters. Um, and one of my students quite heroically decided on her own to try to um, reconstruct it in a way that what the encampment of late Paleolithic hunters might look like with no obvious gender roles. And so you see moving from this very nice heroic man in the front to a woman, to you know, seeing if kids are in the past. So, but. I mean, is it as easy just flipping genders on these kind of stereotypical roles? Is it just, you know, do we just kind of erase some of these guys in the, in the back and bring forward our nice little woman drudging in the background? So Ruth Tringham, so there's been very little discussion um, how to constructively address the visual misrepresentation of women in the past. With Ruth Tringham being one exception, she uh, experimented with graphic representations of uh, Vinca culture houses in 1991. So she would switch between scales, showing gendered social space. Um, and this kind of led on to her uh, work uh, on faceless blobs. She provides, interestingly, an early critique of top-down God vision reconstructions and fly-through experiences. You seem to be able to see everything at once through a crystal ball, but your perception is limited to a view that is external to the social actions, actors and actions. And again, this is 1991. This is very, um, this is pre-virtual uh, reconstructions of that we think of today, and kind of zooming around. Um, and so, right now that we have the digital, everything is better, right? Everything um, we've moved beyond it. It's, we um, have all these fantastic tools, as our friend um, the artist was saying earlier. You can do incredible things with it. But what we do is we um, generally make completely peopleless cities. Um, now we have very beautifully reconstructed architecture, landscapes, buildings, and um, when we do have people, they are sometimes, at the best, what I call non-player characters, um, which I have written about in the past. And a non-player character is um, somebody that's external to the main action of the story. They are Caesar that stands in front of you and, and, and disgorges information about the villa behind, standing behind him <laughs> without actually interacting, because Caesar would never do that. He would never, you know, you'd come in and he would be lying on a couch, I don't know. But it's just really a very false sense of people in the past where we have these rote descriptions um, coming out of people's mouths. Eric Champion is doing some to mitigate this, but um, I have a different solution that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, or, um, so we get non-player characters, or we have render people. Now, render people is, oh, 
um, <laughs> is uh, what architects call uh, people that are just used for scale in the foreground. Um, and so it's nice because you can get all kinds of uh, representation there, kids, et cetera, et cetera. But as you see, they are two-dimensional constructs. Um, so skipping rapidly ahead, um, we interacting with queer theory can help us with this quite a bit. We're left with a very heteronormative view of the past in our vir virtual reconstructions, and as Smiles and Moser remind us, representation is never innocent. But why is it important? Again, as we do our advanced bioarchaeological techniques, we are remiss to now build these empty warehouses of culture. And so I had to move back from my original title and um, saying that doing these very fashion forward things just to find the queerness in the past. So I'm kind of stuck back into this feminist thing where it's like, how do you actually just find and represent people? Um, and so archaeologists such as Barb Voss um, explore identity very productively. Queer theory provides several strands of investigative possibilities. First, as a critique of interpretations that characterize the past in terms of Western models of sex and fam family structure which is monogamous, heterosexual, and nuclear families. Second, to recognize the inherent necessity of archaeological investigations of sex, sexuality, and intimacy. And third, to question rigid categorizations and take it for granted assumptions that limit our interpretations of the past. And finally, to recognize inherent connection between theory, method, and practice. But to study identity is to embrace paradox. This is very hard to do visually. Um, and so when you visualize something, we move it uh, into a, an explained thing, a codified thing. It, it is a whole theory rather than just pieces of a theory put together. So three ways that I think we can possibly get around this, and I'm really happy to have other suggestions. Um, and the first one, Detoma, which I cover a little bit in uh, my punk DIY and anarchy article. Um, and this is just taking visual representations that already exist, um, Moser's vestigial museum pieces, and adding something a little bit, you know, there. <laughs> and then uh, Sarah Perry also does this very productively um, in her uh, kind of getting old article now, the Fractured Media. And but I always like to tease her about it because I tell her that she's reproduced the faceless blobs of, of Ruth Tringham. Nobody laughs. That's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Another way we can do it, possibly, is through comics and video games, and um, I've had a lot of discussions with John, uh, with John Swagger about how to possibly do this, and um, I also have discussed with him that it's actually quite useless to speak at this very time when you put a comic on the screen, everybody reads the comic, it's an incredibly compelling visual medium um, that you can combine words and images together, and this, Flintstones, holy crap! Um, who would have thought the Flintstones would be, provide a uh, subversive voice in the world of comics in 2016? You should pick it up, it's quite interesting. Um, and so going through comics, you can see that it's, it's not obviously real, it's not trying to, to portray something that was, is, is factual, but this feels more truthy to people than uh, what we can reproduce as archaeologists. This actually introduces these theories a little bit better, you can kind of read it. Um, also, video games, um, though that's where we're kind of bordering on to non-player characters again. One of our fantastic PhD students, Megan Dennis, presented on Archaeology of the Dating Game, C14 Dating, um, which you can uh, date uh, men, but you can also date women. Um, and so uh, providing the choice in who you hook up with might be an option for us moving forward in representation. And my favorite now, um, Avatars and Embodiment. I probably only have about one minute left for this. Um, Maybe less tracks, one minute <laughs> And I'm really happy that, um, oh, moving back then, uh, <laughs> that Donna Haraway's come up over and over again in this session because uh, her newest piece um, about the Cthulhu scene talks about fan fiction that we can create. We can actually um, take all of these concepts together and create something new and exciting. Um, but also, you know, Haraway cyborgs come into um, avatars, and I like to especially lean on uh, Elizabeth Grosch for this, the moving the body from the periphery to the center of interpretation, um, but also visualizing is to make it cultural, com culturally complete, to make it static, but we need to, if you don't visualize, you also silence. 
I'm sorry, this is a very, it's very hard to explain the problems in this. This is a work I did in um, 2007 with the O'Coffee team at, back at Berkeley. Um, we recreated Tetelhuyuk in Second Life. Um, it was a visualization that we lived in from 2007 to 2011. It is um, fully visualized and we, we did all kinds of things with it, um, one of which was make a machinima, which is a video, uh, a film completely created within a video game. And I found it extremely productive <coughs> in many ways. Um, to visualize the past life ways and the architecture, et cetera, et cetera. It's gone now. Um, it, it died because of lack of funding. And then, but I found it very productive in that we had students, um, we cast them in roles that pre existed, and so we, we had them draw lots for them. So it we didn't necessarily map onto um, their preconceived ideas about their own identity. They had to be pregnant women, they had to be. One had a ghost written into the script. Um, one had to be a little child, and it was very interesting to see how they, um, how that changed how they interacted with the space, and how they ch it changed their ideas about the past and what they could have worn. Um, so becoming an avatar is a very, very personal uh, experience, and I think a very interesting way that we can completely mess with pe people's ideas about people in the past. Um, another way is the, uh, my good friend and colleague Stu Eve's brilliant work in augmented reality. This is Dead Man's Eyes, the topic of his PhD, which I highly recommend that you go and look up. Um, and so we've been working with him to possibly take his Dead Man's Eyes, which is a phenomenological uh, recreation of um, this Iron Age space, and then map on bioarchaeological affordances to it. So we, in some cases, you might actually have the skeletons of people that, uh, that inhabited the landscape. What can, how, how can we use these skeletons to remake our ideas about the landscape? So uh, what is a, dear, a, a queer digital archaeology? Um, I need to try to go from representing queerness to queering representation and to resist normativity. Of course, part of um, queering digital archaeology is actually never to become normative, never to become static, keep moving, um, keep being creative. And it's an open question. I don't really have an answer, but we have to keep trying because representation is incredibly important. Thank you.